When they talked about their playing days, it was almost as if it was Dorothy talking about the good times she had in the land of Oz. Um, and it, there was, it was a rarefied moment in time that they got to be a part of. And so many of these girls were, you know, they were farm girls. And this was just almost, an, it was an anomaly, especially back in the 40s. Um, you know, baseball has always been seen as this masculine fraternity. So for them to get an opportunity to have this league, not just for one year, but for almost 12 years, was pretty remarkable. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Ah, yes, the dulcet tones of Corey Coates, announcing yet another fun-filled and exciting episode of Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for joining us. Uh, If it's your first time here, thank you uh, uh, tremendously for navigating the wilds of podcast land and finding us and downloading us and putting us into your earbuds. We appreciate all the effort. And uh, if you're a return visitor, well, we appreciate your process of doing so that first time and coming back on a regular basis. Uh, Either way, however you got here, uh, we hope not to disappoint, and I don't think we will. Today's uh, episode's an interesting and fun one as we try to make them to be. Uh, And the topic is baseball. Uh, but a particular slice of baseball, and that is women and baseball. How uh, that sort of tenuous mix of uh, the uh, the pursuit of of women playing baseball on an amateur, but in particular for our conversation on a professional basis, uh, which is a, a torturous history at that. And uh, our guest today is our convenient excuse to get into the professional endeavors uh, that women have uh, pursued to play baseball in the United States. And his name is John Leonidikis. Uh, And he is the uh, creator, the uh, director, the producer uh, of a whole bunch of things, but in particular, uh, a web series, a web television series called The Sweet Spot, uh, which is uh, a treasury of baseball stories. Uh, It's a streaming TV channel. It is available on Roku, uh, Vimeo On Demand, and most interestingly and most uh, uh, probably most broadly on Amazon Prime. So if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can find The Sweet Spot, a treasury of baseball stories uh, out there now. Uh, and uh, season three, which is the current season, just launched, uh, is uh, is the focus of our uh, our conversation. Uh, that season is called Shutout, the Battle American Women Wage to Play Baseball. And uh, there's a particular chapter in that, uh, in this season, uh, which is devoted to the professional uh, exploits of women and, uh, and baseball uh, in the United States. And it is our, of course, our convenient excuse uh, to go deeper into uh, into some of those uh, leagues and attempts. And uh, that is uh, a focus of what we do here on this little podcast. And um, I think it's probably the most uh, the most famous of those uh, is the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League that ran from 1943 to 1954, uh, made famous, of course, by the uh, 1994 film A League of Their Own with uh, Rosie O'Donnell and Tom Hanks and Madonna and others. And uh, that actually uh, led to a not only a rediscovery, I guess, of the fact that women in baseball actually existed as a professional thing back in the day, but also uh, the launch of uh, an actual barnstorming team called the Colorado Silver Bullets from 1994 to 1997 uh, that then also begat an actual uh, second shot at an actual league uh, in 1997 called Ladies League Baseball. And then for a shorter period of time, the following year, 1998, called Ladies, the Ladies Professional Baseball League. Uh, we're going to talk about all of those particular areas and topics and nooks and crannies uh, with our guest, John Leonidikis, uh, in a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. I think you're going to find it very interesting, as I did. Uh, promotionally, we want to, of course, remind you that uh, our friends at Audible are our um, esteemed partners and uh, sponsors, and we, of course, thank them uh, profusely for sticking with us for our first six or seven months of existence. And we encourage you, of course, to give Audible a try, as many of our listeners have. And of course, it's all about audiobooks. And there are 180,000 plus titles of said audiobooks to be found on the Audible service. If you go to audibletrial.com slash good seats, uh, you will uh, enjoy one of those titles for free on us gratis. Uh, as well as experience a 30-day trial of the Audible service uh, by doing so. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free audiobook download 
of, like I said, over 180,000 plus titles. If you can't find one in that gigantic roster of, of, of availability, well, you know, I, I don't know what planet you're on, but uh, you got to find something there. And uh, again, 30 days of free trial. And you can cancel at any time. I need to uh, underline that. Uh, and it's, it's a good deal all around. Again, it's audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day trial of the Audible audiobook service, as well as your free audiobook download for you to listen to and hopefully enjoy. Thank you, Audible. And uh, thank you for giving it a try. We appreciate it. All right, let's uh, not waste any more time. Let's get to our very intriguing conversation uh, with filmmaker John Leonidikis uh, about the various uh, professional baseball exploits uh, of women in the United States here coming up on The Big Show. Maybe we can start at the start. Uh, give us uh, and our audience a bit of a background of about you uh, and uh, how you uh, not only came across um, this topic for season three, but the whole series uh, in general, as well as your background as a uh, as a pro. I'm assuming that you've got some uh, expertise and exposure to uh, television production and the like. That's right. Well, I'll start uh, as a kid. I grew up in San Francisco in the 1960s. I was born in 1958. And my brothers introduced me to the wonders of uh, baseball cards, which became my passport into the country of baseball. And our local team was the Giants. And we loved Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, and Juan Marichal, and the rest of them. And um, there were three things that were constants in my childhood. And that was going to the movies, watching television, reading comic books, and and playing with my baseball cards. That's four things. <laughs> but um, I, I, I love baseball. I played it every day, seemingly, as a kid. I played Little League Baseball. My next-door neighbor, um, Sharon Mullins, her father had been drafted by the Yankees right before World War II. So some of the kids in that family had some uh, athletic skills. And Sharon was the only girl who played with us, and she was good. She could hit, throw, run, catch. She was one of the gang. And we played every day, seemingly, um, as kids. And then sometime around the seventh grade, she kind of vanished off the diamond. And I, I, that always kind of stuck with me. I wondered what happened. Um, but I continued my love of baseball and following it um, on through high school. I wasn't good enough to make my high school baseball team. I think I actually had the ability, but I lacked the confidence. Uh, so I switched over to playing uh, sandlot baseball in high school and then doing uh, playing a lot of softball, which I continue to do today. But when I left high school and started college, um, my major was uh, fine and communication arts, and my uh, focus was on uh, – motion picture and television production. So I essentially went to film school at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. I moved from San Francisco to LA in 76, and um, I've been here ever since. Uh, my love for the game has always been very strong for me. And <clears throat> in 1989, the, the Giants finally made it back to the World Series after the last time they had been was about 1962, I believe, when they lost in seven games to the Yankees. And I, as a youth, actually worked at Candlestick Park from 1970 to 75 in the parking lots. My family ran a parking concession out there, and that's where um, the kids in the family went to go to learn about business and to get off the streets and keep, out, keep us out of trouble. And uh, that just deepened my love for the Giants and baseball. And so when they went to the World Series in 89 – my brother was a season ticket holder and he invited me to go to game three with him. Well, this was a big moment. I, my first World Series game, I borrowed my dad's VHS camcorder and I brought my 35 millimeter uh, SLR uh, with about 10,000 rolls of film to capture the experience. And um, we shot a bunch of stuff out in the parking lot, interviewed some people, just sort of taking it all in. And we got inside to the ballpark. It was about 40 minutes before the game was going to start, which I believe first pitch was scheduled for 535. I went to go get a hot dog. And we had great seats right off of uh, third base, between third base and left field, right on the field level. And went and get in line to get a hot dog. And at 5.04 p.m., a 6.9 earthquake erupted, which, uh, of course, uh, ended the game. Uh, because there was no power in the stadium. Uh, I stayed the intervening 10 days in San Francisco because I wasn't going to get gypped out of my only chance to go to a World Series game. 
But I had shot all this footage and I, I continued to shoot in the intervening 10 days in and around San Francisco. And then when I went back, you know, I was able to kind of be able to tell this story in three acts. And I had all that footage and I, I kind of didn't do anything with it for a long time uh, until as my career began to progress in the film industry uh, and in the entertainment business in Los Angeles, uh, right around 2009, I, I sort of had that midlife crisis moment where you look in the mirror and you say, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I, and I, I had had a very successful career up to that point, producing TV commercials. Uh, I was producing theme park attractions for Walt Disney Imagineering for all of their uh, parks and uh, cruise ships and so forth around the world. Um, but I had worked on a documentary called The Wrecking Crew, which has been a very successful music documentary sure. that my friend Denny Tedesco produced and directed. Yes, I have, seen, I have seen it and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Uh, but Denny was one of my good friends. We went to college together and uh, we'd actually done a documentary about his father, Tommy, who was in all likelihood the world's most recorded guitarist in the history of the record business. We made a little documentary about him in the early 1980s. Uh, it got shown on our local PBS station and that was about it. Then we did a jazz music video for him in 1988. And, um, and then in 96, Denny told me, hey, I'm going to, you know, I want to make this film about my dad and the, the people that were all these studio musicians that were the studio band for all these big hit records that came out of Los Angeles between 1958 and 1962, La Bamba being the first of them, all the way going through working with uh, the Carpenters and the Captain and Tennille. And in between that, they were the studio band for the Beach Boys, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, uh, Frank and Nancy Sinatra, uh, Gary Lewis and the Ploy Boys, the Mamas and the Papas. Uh, it just it was like the Dead Sea Scrolls of 20th century music. And it was all the music I grew up listening to. Uh, and I'm also a guitar player. And uh, these people were sort of my heroes. So I worked on that project with him for about five years. And when um, I, I it got the filmmaking bug had sort of bitten me. And I said, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I said, you know, I'd like to make films about baseball. Uh, I know a lot about it. I love baseball. And in 2002, I had really gotten immersed into a, a whole other side of the game, really what I would consider the human side of baseball, by becoming a member of the Baseball Reliquary, which is kind of a left coast uh, version of Cooperstown that's uh, – it's uh, it's got an, uh, an its own academic bent. It's iconoclastic. It's got an irreverent side to it, and they really honor and acknowledge uh, people from all walks of life who have impacted the landscape of our national pastime. And I saw an article in the newspaper saying there's going to be this Hall of Fame event in Pasadena, and they were inducting Shoeless Joe Jackson, Minnie Minoso, and Mark the Bird Fidrich. I said, "Wow!" And it was free. I said, "How can I miss this?" So I went up there, and at the time, I was really disenchanted with baseball, with all of the cheating and the corporatization of the game. All the fun seemed to have been squished out of it. And I went to this event. Minnie Minoso was there. Um, and it was, it was like going to a religious revival tent meeting. I came out of there completely re-energized. I had found my tribe, and um, it, it, it kept me – excited and interested in baseball and not just in contemporary baseball but baseball history i'd been i'd lived long enough to follow the game since the 60s on for, uh, uh, onward and uh so i decided i would like to make films about baseball but look at them uh, from the human side of the game because i think that's something that appeals to anyone people love a good story and that narrative is really at the heart this is really the heart and soul of baseball so the, um, one of the first things I did was to make a documentary about the baseball reliquary, and it was called uh, uh, Not Exactly Cooperstown, and it's come, become kind of a cult favorite amongst uh, uh, people in the baseball subculture. And the second piece I did was I actually went ahead and um, decided to do a documentary about my experience at the 89 World Series, and um, that's called The Day the World Series Stopped, not to be confused with the ESPN version uh, for their 30 for 30 series called the day the series stopped. Uh, and then from there I produced and directed 
a documentary about uh, one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century who was also a sports writer, and his name is Arnold Haino, who wrote one of the iconic baseball books, um, A Day in the Bleachers. And I, I remember getting Arnold's biography of Willie Mays when I was 10 years old. And I, I distinctly remember the name of the man who wrote that book, little knowing that about 50 years later, I would make a film about him. And uh, that film um, is, is a favorite of mine because Arnold is not only a terrific writer who, also, who, who, who met Babe Ruth and saw Babe Ruth play and uh, actually had a ticket and saw the Don Larson's perfect game. Uh, but he's become a friend. Um, I learned a lot about writing from Arnold, and he's also a social activist um, who's done some uh, wonderful things uh, for minorities as well as the environment. Um, so that piece came along, and I was looking to do something a little bit different in my documentary work. Um, I wanted to tell more stories over a shorter period of time to sort of amortize my costs over the long haul. And one of my college friends, Kelly Holtzclaw, and I would get together for lunch every year and we'd catch up on what our projects were. And, and he says, you know, you keep telling me these baseball stories and these films you're making. He says, I don't even like baseball, but these stories are fascinating. Have you ever thought of starting a streaming television channel featuring these baseball stories? I said, no, but there's a hell of an idea. And that's really what got me started with The Sweet Spot. And, um, you know, we began our, our first season started airing on Amazon and Roku and Vimeo on demand last December and this past January. But to answer your question about um, uh, the women in baseball story and w why we're addressing it here in The Sweet Spot, um, you know, I... I, 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 you know, as a filmmaker, you're always looking for good stories. And um, I, had, I had heard of an organization in the, in the Los Angeles area called Baseball for All. And it was run by Justine Siegel, uh, who's a bit of a baseball pioneer in her own right. She's the first woman to pitch uh, batting practice to a Major League Baseball team, which was the Cleveland Indians in 2011. And then I believe in the fall of 2015, she's the first woman to be hired to be a coach for a major league baseball team. And she was a pitching coach for the Oakland A's fall ball team in uh, 2015. But she had experienced her own uh, gender discrimination when she went from Little League and wanted to play high school baseball. And the coach there said, we don't want girls on this team. Girls, boys play baseball and girls play softball. And she got into a position ultimately, she said, you know, I want to be in a position where I can create opportunities for girls to coach, uh, play and umpire baseball at any level. And she's done a tremendous job. This is a grassroots level uh, type of thing that she's gotten going. And it's, it's grown to some uh, wonderful proportions at this point. But I'd heard about them and um, I heard that they were going to be having um, sort of an all-star girls all-star team baseball tournament with girls from the Southern California area against girls from Australia. Australia is very popular. Uh, baseball is very popular in Australia, and they've long had a girls team there called the Aussie Hearts. So um, I asked Justine, I'd like to come down and 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 shoot the game and document the the, the tournament. And I stayed. I, I covered it for a couple of days, and. I was bowled over by the experience. It was maybe the purest baseball experience I've ever seen or been a part of. These girls, they were between the ages of, I would say, 13 and 16. And I've just never seen kids play with that kind of love and passion, the willingness to learn, the sportsmanship, the camaraderie between the girls on both teams because they all stayed in the same hotel together and they sort of bonded on and off the field. Um, and it just captured my imagination. And then I began hearing stories of the kinds of uh, gender discrimination these girls were going through, even in this you know, so-called enlightened age that we live in. Um, and it, became, it was kind of like unpeeling an onion. It just it, you, The stories took me deeper and deeper and deeper into 
the challenges American girls and women have faced. I had no idea, for example, that American girls and women, uh, American girls weren't allowed to play Little League Baseball until 1974. And that was only because they were sued. Little League uh, did not allow girls to play baseball, and they found out that there was a girl pitching for uh, a team called the Hoboken Democrats in New Jersey. She was very good, and her name was Maria Pepe. And um, one of the coaches on a, of an opposing team ratted her out and, and you know, told the um, – uh, the central office about it, and they, the Little League main office told the Hoboken team, said, you either kick that girl off the team or we're, we're uh, revoking your charter. And so, you know, they went ahead and did this. And that whole story in and of itself is, is, is really something. But um, so that was kind of a shocker. I had stopped playing Little League baseball in 72. And of course, there were no girls playing in the uh, Catholic youth organization when I was playing. Um, but I wasn't aware of that, and of course, everyone's very familiar with the film A League of Their Own, which was really the only major sort of substantive professional women's baseball league that we've had in this country. Um, well, let's, but I, let, let's get into that a little bit because <clears throat> there, there uh, you know, this uh, we're, we're referencing uh, the, the current season um, uh, of your of your series. It's called uh, the, in this particular season is called Shutout: The Battle American Women Wage to Play Baseball, and and you're you're referencing. Yeah, this is clearly not a new phenomenon. This sort of a discrimination and an inability to uh, to to allow girls and women to play uh, baseball uh, uh, on its own terms, and it, and it goes back right. So the first, you know, your your episode number six is called "A Game of Their Own," and mm -hmm. uh, it, it of all the episodes of this season, it touches probably most specifically on the various attempts, at least on the pro level. Uh, for girls slash women to play uh, professional baseball in some manner, shape, and form. Um, my guess is that <clears throat> one of the things that you got drawn back into uh, as you as you discovered uh, this story and as it started to play out was the origins of that with with the All American Girl uh, Professional Baseball League in in the uh, early to mid nineteen forties. Uh, do you want to maybe uh, touch upon that a little bit and, and maybe some of the folks that you came into contact with from that original league that maybe opened your eyes even further? Sure. And as a precursor to all that, I found out that women had been involved in playing baseball as far back as 1867. Oh, that's not uh, a surprise. With, with the Vassar College team. And, and, and you know, the women had their own barnstorming teams um, and, and they, you know, they played and were a part of the American baseball scene at least until 1909, and there, there was some initial discouragement that came from Albert Spaulding, who declared baseball is America's sport, it's a masculine sport, and therefore women can't play. Um, they continued to do sort of barnstorming and playing up until around the 1920s, but the emergence of men's minor league baseball, sort of that it sort of proliferated and it just kind of shoved opportunities for women's baseball kind of off the stage at that point until we get to the beginning of World War II with all the men marching off to war. Uh, Philip Wrigley, the owner of the Chicago Cubs, uh, with a couple of other people, formed the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League to continue to keep interest in baseball. And, um, you know, it went from 1943 to 1954. And, uh, Everybody knows about this league because of Penny Marshall's film, A League of Their Own, which, by the way, is the most successful baseball film in the history of cinema. In any case, um, I re at that uh, tournament that I mentioned uh, between the Australian girls and the girls from Southern California, I met three former players from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And they are Maybelle Blair, who was a pitcher for the Peoria Red Wings. I met Shirley Berkovich, who was a utility player who played on a number of teams. And uh, another um, uh, gal whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but I, I got to meet them there. And um, I decided uh, 
that um, it would be – this was a great opportunity while I was shooting that, that tournament. I said, well, why don't I interview these, these two women who have been such a big part of baseball history? Even though that film was made about them, a lot of, a lot of the details aren't really well known about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Like, for example, a lot of people think that it sort of dried up when World War II ended, and that really isn't the case. Um, you know, they, they were just getting started – the um, in 1944, they drew 450,000 fans, and by 19 what was it? Golly, uh, by 1948 or so, they were drawing nearly a million fans, and even had girl. They even had uh, uh, players from Cuba, because they had done spring training in Havana in 1947 and exhibition games in 1948. Uh, interestingly enough, um, African Americans were not invited to be a part of the All American Girls Professional Baseball League. But some of the stories I really enjoyed hearing about, you know, I was talking to Maybell and Shirley and I, I interviewed them together and I asked the both of them, you know, kind of what it was like, what was the experience? And I was going, you know, you guys, you had to play in dresses. And uh, Maybell was saying, she says, I'm still picking gravel out of my uh, out of my side. She said, we had those strawberries like you wouldn't believe. But if you didn't wear the dresses, you didn't play. And, you know, they did have an undergarment underneath the dresses that still didn't prevent them from tearing up their uh, their thighs as they um, as they slid into the bases and so forth. And I asked them, I said, tell me about who were the best pitchers you faced. And this was this was great stuff because uh, Maybell said there was a pitcher named Lois Florick and she pitched for the South Bend Blue Sox, the Kenosha Comets and the Rockford Peaches. She threw serious heat. She, Maybell said, I was terrified. You had no idea if that ball was going to be a strike or if, you, or if it was going to hit you in the head or if you were going to get killed. But Florick was amazing. She holds the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League's best single season earned run average of 0.67 in 1949. She also threw the most innings that year, 269, had the best winning percentage. She was um, what was almost 800 and she had an a cumulative uh, win loss record of 86 and 60, a cumulative earned run average of 1.4. And what, in, a, in 165 games, she had 774 strikeouts. And um, she was a force. And then I asked Shirley the same question. I said, who, who was the pitcher that was the most dominant? She said, Gene Fout, F A U T. And, uh, and Shirley, Shirley, I think she played about four years, and she said she threw really hard. Jean Fout played for one team, the South Bend Blue Sox, from 46 to 53. Two-time player of the year, regarded by many as the best overhand pitcher in the league's history. 140 wins to 64 losses, a cumulative earned run average of 1.23. In 1,780 innings pitch, uh, 913 strikeouts. So it was amazing to hear that there were there were you know women who could th who could throw serious gas. So when you engage them in, in conversation, I mean, uh, it it seems to me, and I've seen you know obviously some of the, some of the pieces in, in your piece, um, some of their interviews in your piece. Um, it's there's almost like a a spark or a glint in their eye, you know, sort of a not only a, a you know a fond memories, right, but also. Uh, how it's almost still a cause, right? It's it's still girls slash women are just as good, if not uh, better, at being able to play the sport of baseball, and it almost feels like it's a, it's part of a an ongoing mission, not just a, a time in their past, right? They still feel very it feels very alive, the whole spirit still, despite their advanced age and and you know the the memories I guess associated with that uh, that league back in the forties and fifties. Absolutely. They are tireless advocates, advocates for girls in baseball. They travel the country uh, participating in, in these events. Baseball for All holds a national tournament every year, and, and they're sort of the sort of lead ambassadors for that. But when they talked about their playing days, it was almost as if it was Dorothy talking about the good times she had in the land of Oz. Um, and it, there was, it was a rarefied moment in time that they got to be a part of. And so many of these girls were, you know, they were farm girls. Um, and this was just uh, almost, an, it was an anomaly, especially back in the 40s. Um, you know, baseball has always been seen as this masculine fraternity. So for them to get an opportunity to have this league, not just for one year, but for almost 12 years, 
um, was pretty remarkable. And, you know, uh, recently when Jackie Robinson had his statue unveiled at Dodger Stadium, I was there for that, as was Maybell and Shirley. And later on that day, um, uh, they, uh, Maybell and Shirley both met Sandy Koufax, who had a lot of respect for them and what they had done and what they had gone through just to play the game. So it's also pretty interesting too, though, when you you look at the the history and how the how the league was set up, right? Obviously, a lot of it was, you know, men going to war and how do you keep interest in the sport up and and obviously as a distraction, just in general for for the home homebound uh, uh, folks in in the states. Um, but you know, it's still also not necessarily the most uh, I don't know egalitarian of setups, right? I mean, you still had. You had uh, uh, codes of conduct and you had a, you know, fight song and there was sort of like, you know, uh, dress requirements and need to wear lipstick at all times. And, you know, there's almost sort of this prim and proper, you know, ladies can play, but they need to also be sort of, you know, uh, defined and, and, and rule bound uh, because uh, we don't want any, you know, untoward, uh, you know, uh, perceptions of, of of women on the on the ball field. So I'm just curious as to you get at any of that sort of. I don't want to call it a double standard, but it seems like it was, you know, defined for them. It wasn't necessarily as, uh, you know, uh, free spirited, perhaps, as maybe uh, a pure equal shot at playing sports uh, might be perceived today. Yes, it was very regimented. Uh, Wrigley was very savvy about building a brand and putting a product on the field. And in putting that product on the field, it had to be just so. So these girls all went to charm school. Both of them talked about that. Um, uh, they talked about what an incredible experience it was to be able to play with uh, all women because most of them were, you know, sort of tomboys or they were, you know, they played, they played on boys or men's team. They were sort of the anomalies in their little, uh, their, their communities. And so being able to play to get, play with women uh, for the first time was really exhilarating for them. Um, and you know, they, they had, they went along with all of it because they realized, uh, we're getting paid to play baseball. It's good money. Um, you know, Maybell said that, you know, a, a scout saw her playing softball and he, it's a great story because he said, um, you know, I, I, I want you to come, there's going to be this professional women's baseball league. I'd like you to come try out. And she, you know, she thought this guy was, was pulling her leg or trying to you know, pull a wool over her eyes. And he said, she said, there's no way my parents are going to let me go off to some half cocked girls, professional baseball league, which nobody's ever heard of. And, uh, she took the guy back to her house and, you know, they explained it to him and they all looked at him like he was, was green with three heads. And they said, there's no way our, our kid's going to go off to this thing. She said, look, we're going to pay your daughter, your daughter this much money every week. And at, at this point, her Maybell would have been making more money than her father. And uh, her mother said, George, crank up the car because we're packing her suitcase and she's going to go try out for this league. Um, and so it's, it's those types of experiences that they shared with me that were, you know, just remarkable, um, especially back in that era. And I also asked them about, you know, we, we know about the unwritten rules in baseball, especially when men are playing. If, if, you know, if somebody feels like one team feels like they've been shown up, somebody's going to take a pitch to the ribs or there's going to be trash talk and this, that, and the other thing. And I asked him, I said, did you guys get in any of that? Was there any, did you feel like you, people were showing you up at any point on the field? And was there retaliation? They said, you know, th there was none of that. And I've actually in talking to women who played uh, the game in contemporary times, that's not part of their culture. It's, it is a man thing. It is a t likely a testosterone driven thing, but uh, that's one of the interesting distinctions between men's and women's baseball that I have found that goes all the way back to the 1940s to today, where they're much more interested in getting on with the game and less interested in, you know, uh, you know, getting after each other the way men do if they, when they feel they've been slighted on the field of play. Well, it does seem, uh, at least through the, uh, the, uh, the memories and the, uh, the on-camera interviews with Maybell and Shirley that, um, that they did, it seemed like they had a hell of a lot of fun, no? Oh yeah, it was a, it was a grand old time and they, they remember it all wistfully.
Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. So did you ever get into conversation with them about why it took so long after the demise of the league in the mid 1950s for women and baseball to come back together again what another 40 50 years until 40 50 years later right what it almost seems like it kind of went dark after all of that sort of excitement and exuberance you know you'd think that the idea of women and baseball would be an ongoing thing based on all that success you know, it was just tamped down. Um, again, it was reverting to the old boys network. It, it was um, baseball as a masculine fraternity. Um, there was no real place for women. It, it, and I should, I should say that the uh, AAGPL, uh, BPL, they had a barnstorming team that kept barnstorming around the United States which I think went as far, as long as until 1957 or 58, but a, a very minor blip on the radar, really. And ironically, it was because of the success of Penny Marshall's film, A League of Their Own, that interest in women and baseball kind of got generated. So what happened was in 1994, a businessman from Atlanta struck a $3 million sponsorship deal with Coors, to form a women's professional baseball team called the Colorado Silver Bullets. And essentially, this was a barnstorming team. And they operated from 1994 to 1997. And um, they played games uh, against men's semi-pro teams and regional teams around the United States. And this was the first major effort of, of having girls play professional baseball since the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And um, the first year was um, a remarkable year for them. Uh, first of all, their manager was Hall of Famer Phil Necro. And uh, his coaches included his brother Joe, his son John, and uh, Paul Blair, and um, Joe Pignatano were coaches. They're, those guys were all former major leaguers with the exception of John Necro. Um, one of the players on that team was Julie Croteau, who was uh, the first woman to play NC2A men's uh, baseball. And that was in 1989 at uh, St. Mary's College in Maryland. She's one of a handful of women ever to get a hit in men's NC2A baseball. And, um, but they were, they were overmatched. There were a lot of the players on the team obviously came out of, the so out of softball. And so, you know, and softball and baseball are very, very different sports. So consequently, um, their first season was, was not very good in terms of wins and losses. They won six and they lost 38. They were outscored 57 to one in their first six games. Their, the team batting average over the whole season of 44 games was 154. But they, they got better as they went along. 
Um, they had 11 wins in 95. And after starting 1996 season at 4-19, and 19, they switched to aluminum bats and won 14 of their last 30 games. They could draw people. They drew 42,000 fans at Candlestick Park in San Francisco, 33,000 in Denver, uh, 30,000 in uh, at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, 23,000 at Memorial uh, Coliseum in Oakland. Um, and uh, they actually had a, one of their pitchers pitched a no-hitter in 94. That was Lisa Martinez. They beat the Somerville Yankees, who happened to be the champions of an over-30 amateur league in Charleston, South Carolina. The thing that was really fascinating about this no-hitter was Martinez used her underhand softball delivery to rack up eight strikeouts. Phil Necro said it was the most exciting damn thing I've ever seen in baseball. <laughs> huh. I, so that yeah, that's really interesting. I, before before we go further in that story, because I think it's it's very interesting. I think it's also important to remember that I think this is a little known fact, and and I, I'm sure we'll get into this uh, in some future episodes. We've had a, a few folks that we've uh, uh, tried to to lasso up for um, for conversations about the. Uh, a A G P B L. You said it much more more quickly as I than I could. Um, it, the, the actual baseball is. Yeah, I want to call it a loose term for that, but um, it, it, the that league never really played. I guess what you would call or consider regulation baseball during its existence. Now there were there were some hybrid elements. I guess of softball, especially in the earlier years. Uh, the you know the mound and the the uh, bases were expanded a little later. The balls uh, got uh, smaller uh, over time. Uh, but but the uh, the silver bullets though this was pure modern day baseball from from the get go right you're absolutely right and going back to the AGPBL uh, like you I was a little surprised I thought that they had started out with um, baseball when they got going and that really didn't happen I mean they didn't even allow um, overhand pitching until 1947 the league had been uh, in existence almost four years at that point. Um, and that that from 47 on, they only allowed sidearm and overhand pitching. Um, and it wasn't until 49 that they, you know, the ball was reduced to 10 inches. The distance from home to the mound was lengthened to 55 feet. And it wasn't until 54, the last season, where the mound was 60 feet away, not quite six inches, though. Uh, the base pass got 85 feet. And a lot more home runs were hit at that point. And they used the, then they used a Major League Baseball but only in that last season. But the Silver Bullets, it was um, 100% pure baseball um, from the get-go. Do you think um, the uh, the movie, I, I'm assuming that the movie really was sort of the catalyst for uh, the uh, appetite or the potential appetite for a pro team, all-female uh, baseball uh, pursuit, no? That is absolutely right. I think if that film doesn't happen, this opportunity doesn't occur. That's a, that was a major catalyst for it. And that, you know, there was an interest and there was a hunger for it. And unfortunately, a little bit like some women's uh, baseball uh, projects that have occurred along the way, some of them extremely short lived. We'll go into another one in just a little bit here. Is there, they're sort of viewed as a novelty act. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge with mounting uh, an, a league and stocking a league with credible baseball players is they have to have the opportunity to develop their skills. And, of course, the girls and American women have never really had that because the, the, a wall has gone up uh, from them participating in the game, even after they got to play, started to play Little League Baseball, even in today's uh, game when girls finish Little League they're sort of automatically shuttled off into softball. So in the 90s, it was much of the same thing, where just about all of the girls who who were playing on that team, or certainly most of them, they were all softball players. And uh, it's just a different animal. Uh, the dimensions of the field, the size of the ball, the dynamic, uh, it's just completely different. So it's not, um, it's not surprising that uh, they struggled in terms of being able to play at a competitive level against men's teams. Um, but the fact that they lasted four years was pretty interesting. And the only reason it, the reason it died, they felt that the sort of novelty of it all was wearing off. The, um, Coors was their sponsor. Um, and Coors pulled the plug in 1997. And uh, the organizers of the, the people who ran the league um, or tried to continue to try and find uh, additional funding. And it just, 
uh, never happened. So it all sort of um, fell apart. But they were playing better baseball by the time it all ended, which is, you know, it's sort of a natural thing. The more the more you get to play, the more the better the competition, the more coaching you have. You can't if you're uh, uh, an athlete that's gifted, um, you, you can't help to get better. And that's certainly what happened by by the end of it all. And that's and, you know, I think one of the amazing stories that people don't know about the Colorado Silver Bullets was their their brawl in 1997. Shall I share that story? Absolutely. I was going to ask about that next, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, that was their last league. And um, one of the fine players on the on the Bullets who'd been with them all four years was um, Kim Bratz. And uh, by then she was married. Uh, her, last, her last name was uh, Vo- uh, Kim Bratz Voisard. Um, they were playing um, a team in Georgia. They were playing the America's Travelers, the state champions of Georgia Re- Rec and Park League. Uh, these were the 18 and under champions. So these apparently were boys age 16 to 18. Uh, where are we here in the game? Uh, ninth inning, the um, the Bullets are losing 10 to 6. And there had been a lot of uh, trash talk from the, uh, the the boys team. The catcher was just mouthing off at every every hitter who came up. So there was some bad blood that was brewing. And Kim Bratz, she got nailed. She got hit by a pitch and... Um, th- those girls were saying they were thrown at constantly, way more than you would typically expect, just uh, constantly all throughout that first uh, season. And um, as Kim got down, was headed down first base, she saw the, the pitcher on the mound laughing at her and she snapped. She, she charged the mound, both dugouts emptied, um, and it was a full blown brawl. And uh, there are all these articles in the paper. Look at these, you know, these married 30 year old women are beating up on these teenage boys. Um, But it was good for attendance because I think one of their next games, which happened to be in Alaska, drew 10,000 people. But it was great to see, you know, and and I and I was reading, you know, some of the women who were on that team were saying, you know, the abuse we took, you know, I mean, we knew we would get we were going to get some of it. But, you know, people were spitting on us. Um, the invective, the verbal invective, the taunting, um, they said it really, it was really quite shocking. And that's really a thread that has gone through a lot of the stories of the, some of the women I've, I've, who I've continued, who have continued to play the game up until now, of uh, the, uh, the abuse, the, not only verbal abuse, but the, the physical abuse. Girls told me how they'd been beaten up. They'd been assaulted. You know, Isla Borders, one of the greatest women ever to play the game, four guys uh, beat her up and attempted to rape her to discourage her from playing on her Christian college baseball team. One of those attackers was a teammate of hers. So it's pretty amazing um, that these kinds of things uh, occurred just because a, a girl wanted to play our national pastime. And I think what made this story so compelling to me was, now you're telling me that 50% of uh, American citizens are being discouraged from playing their their national pastime because of their gender. To me, this strikes at the core of what it means to be an American. And to have this sort of uh, uh, mistreatment and abuse being heaped on girls and women simply because they want to play baseball. I felt, I said, this is a huge story. Um, And certainly gender discrimination is is part of American culture. It's a major problem. We're actually seeing it right now. And all the, you know, the skeletons being dragged out of the closet in the closet in the entertainment industry. Um, But I thought that this was a story that was very important. It had never been told. I said, how, how can this story not be told? Where are the newspaper stories? They're few and far between. What do you mean American women can't play baseball? What do you mean they have to play softball and be happy with that? I just thought, I said, this is completely un-American, and why aren't more people pushed out of shape about it? Uh, you might want to also reference uh, one of the episodes of this season is dedicated to um, uh, this, her story, Ida's story, right? Isla's story, yes. Um, she, uh, we, we. One of the things that I think is really powerful in telling these types of stories, Tim, is generational connections. And so, um, 
as part of the storytelling process, um, three of the nine episodes, I wanted to focus on an individual player's journey. Um, and so I, one of them was Isla Borders. And if, if you don't know who Isla Borders is, she's one of the most accomplished women ever to play baseball. Um, she got the first college scholarship to play baseball. Um, she was the first woman to notch a win in men's professional baseball since 1956. She played in the independent league. Um, uh, and um, there were a whole bunch of other firsts associated with Isla, who was a left-handed pitcher. Um, and she went quite far in her career. Um, then I looked at two other women. Um, the next was Lily Jacobson, who again was one of the few women ever to play men's NC2A baseball for Vassar College. And she um, was a pitcher, an outfielder, and a designated hitter. She's one of the few women to get a hit in men's NC2A baseball. And she went on to have um, uh, a, a terrific experience um, playing for uh, Team USA. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that we have a national women's baseball team, and they're one of the best in the world. Uh, but um, she was a designated hitter for the 2006 gold-winning um, Base, American baseball team. And, um, you know, her arc is a, is a tremendous arc in that, you know, she starts out playing in little league. Things get a lot harder for her as she gets into high school, a lot harder in college. Um, and her journey is a remarkable one because her mother starts talking about when she was a, 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 a Sandlot player in the 1950s who could really play. She could, she could hit the ball, she could pitch, but she wasn't allowed to play little league baseball. She was, she was able to see her daughter play and be her champion. And, um, so they had sort of their own story there. And then the third generation we look at is a 10 year old girl. I found playing at the baseball for all tournament in San Francisco, the national tournament, the national girls tournament in 2016. And she was an infielder. And, you know, I asked her, I said, what do you like about baseball? She says, it's fun. And I get to play with the boys and show them up. And, you know, she she is a pistol and she's the only girl playing in her pony little league um, conference in uh, Valencia, which is a suburb outside of Los Angeles here. And um, she plays with a lot of grit, a lot of heart and determination. So interwoven in this story of the journey American women have taken in trying to participate in baseball, not just playing, but coaching and umpiring. Um, I, I, uh, we have these sort of stops along the way to experience these uh, journeys and adventures. These three different women from three different generations have experienced. And uh, it really touched me, everything that they've gone through. And I, what really struck me was the, especially Isla and Lily was the emotional and psychological and physical trauma they went through to play. And one of the, one observation I'd heard from women players was that the worst verbal abuse came from women in the stands versus men. Hmm. Why was that? You know, it's kind of heartbreaking. I, I I think it kind of goes back to the, so, our, the social constructs we have in our culture, whereas you know women have traditionally been seen as a sort of mothers and raising children, um, and this business of being out on the field of play, even though women's sports is is very much a going concern, um, it's still I think very much seen as an anomaly. It, even people in the media, if there's a, a girl who's a really good pitcher, they'll say, "Wow." You know, they, they sort of treat her like she's a freak of nature when, you know, anybody who has some athletic ability, the more chances they get to improve as a player, they're going to do that regardless of gender. It's sort of like saying, wow, look at this uh, woman firefighter. She can really put out that fire. Um, and we, we sort of and along the way, we, we, we met um, and interviewed um, a, a woman emp umpire named Perry Barber. And, uh, you know, and she shared her journey that we've, we've got that mixed into our, our season three of, of what she had to go through just to become an umpire uh, in a little league and kind of moving her way up through the ranks. And she's been umpiring since 1981. But they all tell the same story of having to fight this gender bias 
to participate in playing baseball. And it still isn't any easier for them all because Title IX is uh, that requirement is satisfied in high school and college uh, by the provision of baseball. And no school is going to offer both baseball and softball because of the budgetary constraints that they've got. So there's a real conundrum in trying to solve this problem. How are girls going to get on the field and become uh, better baseball players beyond Little League if they don't get the chance to play baseball in high school and in college? Well, there, you know, there's also something to be said about, uh, and we've seen this with certainly with basketball, uh, certainly soccer uh, of late. Uh, there is no, or was no, or is no uh, professional league to which uh, women can aspire to. So, in some respects, that's also sort of a double negative or a double whammy, right? Because it's like, well, why continue with this? You know, if there's really no logical conclusion, especially if I'm any good at it, right? And it seems like the last attempt was uh, in the wake of uh, the success that the Silver Bullets had, which was this uh, year and maybe a half uh, attempt with uh, what was first called Ladies League Baseball in 1997 and then renamed and reconstituted as the Ladies Professional Baseball League in 1998. Um, I think you've also spoken to a few of the players uh, from that era as well. And I guess uh, the idea is right as to pick up on sort of your last thread. Um, you know, it's one thing to sort of play with the men, I guess, and, and have a, have a, uh, sort of be saddled with this whole idea that, you know, you can't, it's hard to play against men when you've had very little opportunity to, to develop your, your game in the lead up to, you know, playing professionally against men. Uh, I guess the, the logic would be, well, okay, how about a, a league that, that women can actually play in and then aspire to, uh, and over time, perhaps get to some level of equality uh, on their own merits. Sure. And it's worth noting, Tim, that there is a professional women's baseball league in Japan, and that's been going since 2007. There's only four teams, but that's a very spirited league, and it, they do well. But to get back to the ladies league baseball, um, this was a league that was primarily in California. It also involved a, a team in Arizona. And there were five teams. Um, and again, this was, you know, a, a league of their own kind of helped get get this going, too. Uh, they had five teams. They were the San Jose Spitfires, the San Francisco Bay Sox, the Long Beach Aces, the Phoenix Peppers and the Los Angeles uh, Legends. And they had one full season, uh, 97, and the San Jose Spitfires defeated the Legends. And Janelle Fries of the Legends won that league's version of the Cy Young Award. And two of the members of the San Jose Spitfires uh, are interviewed uh, in our season three of the, of the sweet spot, the shutout, the battle uh, American women wage to play baseball. And they are Rochelle Rocky Henley. Rich, uh, Rocky also played on the 1994 uh, Colorado Silver Bullets team. And, um, and then uh, the team's catcher, who is a, a really a, a very special player, by the name of Alex Sickinger. Um, the thing that was amazing about Alex was, you know, she grew up playing softball with girls, and when she went to high school, softball wasn't offered. So she wanted to play baseball, so she tried out for the men's team, made the team as their starting second baseman, and then ultimately displaced the starting catcher. So, you know, and she went on to, you know, win all these all-league honors in high school playing against boys. Um, so she was asked to play, uh, for the Spitfires and at age 17, uh, she was named rookie of the year. She was also the defensive player of the year. And, um, she went on to, um, uh, be the catcher for the U S women's national team, uh, in 2003 and 2004 and of the 04 squad, squad winning gold at the women's world cup of baseball in Canada. And the nice thing about the this story kind of ties together is that um, Alex and Rocky have both helped to start the uh, San Francisco Rec and Parks, San Francisco Bay Sox All Girls Baseball League for girls age eight to sixteen in the San Francisco Bay Area, which has really become kind of a pilot program for other cities to emulate uh, to allow girls to play baseball uh, and play with other girls. And it goes on up, in, in, uh, on up in through high school. And because we have this institution of softball, um, the only other way girls can get better at playing 
is to be able to be able to play in these types of of community leagues. So it's very much kind of a grassroots effort and sort of solution uh, to be able to provide these opportunities for girls and women to get better at the game. And by getting better at the game, they'll be able to make uh, the, the teams in high school and compete to make the teams in college. But just being good enough and be, and with sports being a meritocracy, meaning the best players take the field, there's, there's still a big uphill climb because not all coaches, let's face it, it's a game that's administered by men, it's umpired by men, it's coached by men, and a lot of times those men's coaches in high school uh, don't want to see a girl take a position on that field from a boy that might has a better chance of getting a scholarship to play baseball for, in college than she would. But so it, there's that sort of conundrum. But it does still feel, though, right, uh, even in the wake of, of this, uh, the Ladies Professional Baseball League uh, in, in the middle of the season in 1998, it does seem that not these professional exploits uh, dating back to the, to the, you know, to the World War II era uh, uh, don't seem to be, and I think maybe hopefully coming out of your series here, don't seem to be in vain, right? It seems like there are it almost feels more than just grassroots. It feels like there is something much more substantial uh, in the offing for the idea of women and baseball going forward. No, I think so. I think so. And uh, you know, the A G P P L, all that stuff. Um, uh, this is you know, these are the seeds in the garden, and and, and it, it, the, all the wonderful plants began growing and. Like any other garden, the, the plants won't grow unless you nurture them and you water them. And I think we're finally in a place now where that garden will continue to be watered. Uh, we have some great examples of that. Um, every year, Baseball for All has that tournament in the summer. And it's now taking place at Byer Stadium in the Midwest where the Rockford Peaches played. So you're, you're tying – you've got that historical tie from the AAGPBL to today. And you have um, – women who used to play in that league out there exhorting the girls of today to play. And the last tournament they had this year, it drew more girls from North America to play in an all girls baseball tournament in the history of baseball, which is, you know, that's very, very significant. Additionally, we all know about these fantasy camps that major league baseball teams run. Well, for a long time, the Yankees were the only fantasy camp to have a, a camp exclusive for, for women. But now the Boston Red Sox started that a couple years ago, and we touch on that. That's in also in our uh, episode six, a game of their own. We we touch on that experience and what it meant, what it meant to those women. Um, you know, they're they're getting instruction from Rico Petroselli and and Butch Hobson, and all of these men who come into contact with women for the first time playing baseball. They're all they're all struck by the their passion and love for the game. Um, at, at, and let's face it, fantasy campers, you've got people who are on up into their seventies. So you, it really runs the gamut and, you know, baseball knows no boundaries when it comes to age or gender. So we're starting to see more of these types of opportunities and experiences open up for American girls and women. And it should be noted that, you know, up in Canada, I, I worked with Andre Lachance to get some, uh, images and information about their program. They uh, they very much encourage and promote girls to play baseball all through Little League and in high school, and they mix genders. And in some cases in high school and in, in, in playoff games and championship games, all girls teams are playing all boys teams, and they don't have a second thought about it. And Andrew is asking me, what's wrong with you Americans? Why are you treating your, your, your women like this? Um, so this is very much an American problem. Um. I guess my last question is: Of all the people that you talked to in uh, putting this season together, um, does any did any of them feel like there were enough uh, foundational elements to take another shot at uh, another professional league uh, for women for baseball? I think there's hope. There are hopes and dreams. Um, you know, this is these are the baby steps that that will is the first, the, the, the first steps of the long march to be able to develop enough talent to stock a professional league. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason we have uh, the WNBA is because women have been able to play college basketball since the 1970s. 
So it's going to take a while for that to happen. But yes, you can see that dream, the sort of light at the end of the tunnel in the eyes of these people, especially the ones who've been chasing this dream for a long time. But I think the most important thing to a lot of these people is, you know, just give us a chance to play the game that we love. That's all we're asking. And it kind of starts and ends there. All right, there it is. Uh, very uh, intriguing uh, discussion uh, with John Leonidikis. Thank you, John, uh, for being part of our little uh, journey uh, into the realm of forgotten sports. And uh, let us get all the promotional goodness uh, for John uh, underlined here for uh, you to follow through on as listeners. Uh, let's see. Season three of The Sweet Spot, a Treasury of Baseball Stories, which is called Shut Out, the Battle American Women Wage to Play Baseball. It is available now uh, as a streaming channel uh, for you to find on Roku. Uh, you will find it on Vimeo On Demand. And if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you will find it on Amazon Prime. Uh, I also want to call attention to uh, a number of other uh, works that John has done, uh, especially in the realm of baseball. Uh, Hano, A Century in the Bleachers from 2015, uh, is well worth uh, your seeking out. It's a documentary about... Uh, a long time, uh, many, many decades uh, sports writer uh, and his uh, coverage of the sport of baseball. Uh, not exactly Cooperstown, uh, another uh, video slash DVD from 2012, uh, which uh, is, uh, I would argue, is kind of a, uh, a parallel, but in a more uh, wacky and fun-filled and adventurous way to that of uh, baseball's Hall of Fame uh, from the things that uh, didn't quite make the Hall of Fame, shall we say, but uh, are exceedingly notable. Uh, in the history of baseball, uh, nonetheless. Uh, the 2013 documentary uh, from John Leona Dyke is called The Day the World Series Stopped. Uh, that is also available as a uh, streaming download as well as a DVD. We're going to have links to all of these, by the way, on our episode uh, number 38 uh, with John uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Just look for this episode and you will find links to all of those things. Uh, and, and you also, I think, Two other things I got to tell you about John, because he's an interesting cat. Um, he was also uh, very much involved in the uh, production of a, uh, a phenomenal documentary, not related to sports, uh, but in the realm of music. Uh, and it's called The Wrecking Crew. And if you have not uh, seen this, uh, this documentary, uh, which came out, I believe, in 2007. Yeah, hit the film festival market then and came out just uh, thereafter. Uh, this is an amazing story. The Wrecking Crew is of uh, the uh, musicians, the studio musicians in Los Angeles uh, that were literally the backing band for uh, some of the most memorable recordings uh, and artists uh, of uh, our generation, of the generation prior as well. Uh, we're talking about Elvis and Sinatra and uh, Richie Valens and Herb Alpert and uh, the Mamas and the Papas and Dean Martin and Sammy Davis, the Fifth Dimension, the Birds. I mean, you name them, the Wrecking Crew was part of it. Uh, and uh, the uh, shining the spotlight on some of the uh, famous or not so famous uh, studio musicians behind some of those most famous uh, songs and legendary uh, artists uh, of our day. Again, that's called The Wrecking Crew. Uh, that is available as well wherever good DVDs and or streaming downloads are found. Uh, last thing is John Leonidikis also, uh, we kind of, I don't know if we mentioned it uh, in the episode, but it uh, was also instrumental uh, in creating the, uh, the theme attraction at Walt Disney World called Monsters, Inc., laugh floor and it, uh, if, you, if you have kids and you've been there uh, you will know that that is a, a fun and interactive uh, experience where uh, jokes are told in a very interactive way uh, around the whole uh, uh, Monsters Inc. franchise and John was the uh, the brains and the production uh, around that along with the D Disney Imagineering crew so uh, a lot of things to follow up with our guest John Leonidikis uh, and uh, we encourage you to uh uh, partake of those uh, early and often. And we do thank John for being part of our uh, our little episodes here, and uh, we thank you for giving us a listen. Again, for our promotional purposes, again, go to goodseatsstillavailable.com. You'll find all of our uh, current and previous episodes, and uh, as well as links to all the various media uh, that our guests have discussed and talked about and promoted. Uh, please visit there early and often, uh, and you will find us also, of course, on social media. It's Good Seats Still Available. On Instagram, uh, on Twitter, you will find us at Good Seat Still. Uh, like us, if you will, on uh, on Facebook, and um, uh, 
Uh, I can't think of any other thing, but uh, thanks for all your uh, social uh, promotional uh, shout outs and uh, thumbs up and all that stuff. We love it. Uh, we love you. And uh, we thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week here on Good Seat Still Live. Thanks for listening. 